Hello chess friends! This week I've decided to start a project that I've been thinking about for a long time, and its goal will be to shed some light on the question of, who is the greatest chess player of all time? Now obviously, the only way to answer this question for certain would be to bring all the top players together in their prime and have them play one another. Even if this were possible, you would first have to get them all spun up on the latest opening theory and developments and strategy in order to make it a fair fight, since otherwise players from an earlier era would have a huge disadvantage. So I got to thinking, what would be the next best thing? Now some people have suggested looking at the degree to which each player dominates the top players of their day to determine who is the strongest. However, it occurred to me that this might not be ideal, since some of that I think is left up to chance. For example, if Carlsen had been born in the same year as Bobby Fischer, then maybe Fischer would not have been so far above the next strongest player in his day. He would have had Carlsen to contend with. So I think that some of the greatest players have just been fortunate that no other geniuses of their caliber happen to be alive at the same time. So what else can be done to try to determine absolute playing strength? Well, you can measure their accuracy. How often do they make catastrophic blunders or significant mistakes in a typical middle game situation? So I decided to run a blunder check with Stockfish on 10 games from each of the following players. Carlsen, Kasparov, and Fischer. Since I think that 90% of chess players would name one of these three if asked who is the greatest player of all time. Now in order to make this a fair fight, I applied the following criteria to the selection of these games. They all had to have the same opening, so I chose the Sicilian defense. Five games playing white and five games as black for each player. Their opponents had to be of similar strength, around 100 rating points difference or less for Carlsen and Kasparov, and at least strong grandmasters for Fischer, since most of his career was before the ELO system was widely used. So I tried to choose the games of his where he was playing the strongest grandmasters of his day. All the games had to be decisive, no draws. This was to eliminate games in which neither player took very much risk, which might lead to simpler positions where it might be easier for a player to find the right moves. The games also had to have a relatively complex middle game with most of the pieces still on board, no early end games. And finally, all of the games had to have tournament time controls, no rapid or blitz. So next I ran the blunder check on all 30 games, using Stockfish 15 with a threshold of 0.5 pawns, and wrote down all of the moves that Stockfish thought were significant errors. Now I started the blunder check at move 10, since much of the opening theory is memorized and computers aren't necessarily at their strongest in the opening anyway, and I stopped the blunder check after one player had a totally lost position for the rest of the game, since you can't really blunder in a dead loss position, and my criteria for dead lost was 2.5 pawns or more in one player's favor, by the way. Also, if you're on the winning side, these positions are probably less difficult to play. So I just wanted to focus on difficult middle game situations where the game is not yet decided. Also, after I had found a mistake, and recorded it, I didn't record any more moves as mistakes for at least another three moves. Since a player might miss the same tactic three times in a row, and I didn't want to record that as three separate mistakes. But if you miss it four times in a row, sorry, then it's going to be counted as another blunder. Okay, so without any further ado, here is the result of the blunder check. As you can see, I've divided up the moves into three types. Inaccuracies, losing blunders, and missed wins. Now the inaccuracies should be taken with a grain of salt, since they don't tend to blunder a lot of material, and are more likely to be based on the positional evaluation of Stockfish, which may not always be as accurate as the players. But the losing moves and the missed wins are based on more concrete tactical sequences and loss of material and or checkmating threats. And I'm actually gonna go through some of these in the second part of the video and show you some of the most severe blunders for each player. So let me explain to you exactly how I have this broken down here. Each player's inaccurate moves are listed in a column underneath their name and they're separated according to inaccuracies, losing moves, or missed wins. Each inaccurate move is represented by two numbers. The number on the right is Stockfish's evaluation of the position before the player made their inaccurate move. And the number on the left is after the player made their inaccurate move. And in case you don't know how Stockfish evaluation works, 0.64 would indicate 0.64 pawns in white's favor. So in this situation, Carlson would have been white, he had a 0.64 pawn advantage, but after he made his move, it dropped down to 0.00 pawns. Negative numbers would indicate a shift in black's favor. Now some of these evaluation shifts were kind of on the fence, whether they could go in the inaccuracies column or the losing moves or the missed wins. I just sort of made an arbitrary cutoff point. Some of these moves you might want to consider to be a missed win as opposed to an inaccuracy 
or vice versa. You can look at these values and decide how you would categorize them if you want to. I should also mention that certain types of moves were not included on this list. For example, if the evaluation changed from like 2.5 pawns in someone's favor to 3 pawns in someone's favor, that's not a very significant change because it doesn't really change the status of the game. The same player is still winning. Okay, let's talk about the actual results here. You can see that in the inaccuracies department, everybody's pretty close. Carlson and Kasparov each have 5 inaccuracies, Fisher has 6. But in the losing moves department, you can see that Carlson has six, as opposed to Kasparov with only three and Fisher only two. So Carlson seems to be the loser on making moves that put him into a losing position. But if you look in the missed wins department, Carlson is the winner in this department because he misses only two wins, whereas Kasparov misses four, Fisher misses three. So according to this data, it seems that Carlson makes more losing moves, but he misses fewer wins. And that seems to be the biggest difference among the three. Overall, Fisher seems to be the winner here. When you put his losing moves and missed wins together, you can see that he has five total, as opposed to seven for Kasparov, and it looks like eight for Carlson. Also, Fisher's total number of inaccurate moves, you know, inaccuracies, losing moves, and missed wins altogether is 11, versus Kasparov with 12, and Carlson with 13. So overall, I would have to say that Fisher comes out the stronger player here. However, we have to remember that we are using the Sicilian defense, which was Fisher's specialty. He was known to have less variety in his play than Carlson and Kasparov, and he liked to stick to the Sicilian defense as black and e4 as white. So it's safe to say he had more experience with this opening. If I run this experiment again and use some different openings, it may be the case that Carlson and Kasparov come out ahead. So I hope you found this interesting. And at this point, I'm going to show you some of the most severe mistakes from each of these players from these 10 games that I selected. So this is my quick overview of six of the positions where blunders were made by Carlson, Kasparov, and Fisher. As I looked at these positions, I realized that some of them are pretty complicated. So with the amount of time I have, I'm not going to be able to do them justice as far as a comprehensive look at all the variations that are relevant. So these are just my initial impressions after devoting just a few minutes to these positions. If you want to look at them more deeply, I would definitely encourage studying these games by these great players. It's never a bad thing for your chess. Okay, this first blunder that we're going to look at comes from a game where Magnus Carlsen has the white pieces against Grishuk in the 2015 Sinkfield Cup. Carlsen goes wrong with the move knight to f2, allowing bishop to e7, which is going to come over here and target this f4 pawn. Okay, so Carlsen tries knight g4, which I'm not even sure this is the best defense that he tries, because he does this wild f5 move. I'm not even sure why he sacks that pawn, and he takes on h6, and after king c2, I guess this pawn cannot be stopped. So that's the deal. Let's look at some other lines though. After knight f2, bishop e7, if you try like king d2, get in front of the pawn, there's bishop d6 targeting the pawn. If you try to defend, then king d5 and the king's coming in here. You can't really stop that and you're just losing. Yeah, king e4. If you try something else like, let's say knight e4 here, we we'll get d3 check and then yeah, this bishop and king are too active. Yeah, this bit, yeah, the king comes in here, you're going to lose. That knight can't hang out there. You go here, well, this is just losing. Okay, so that's all lost. Now, if you play the correct move, though, king to d2, it's a little bit different. Let's look at first bishop e7. Here we got knight e5 check. Since you hadn't moved that knight to f2, you got this nice check. The king goes here, then we go king d3. If the bishop tries to target, we can go like that and the pawn's defended, the king can't come in any closer. If white tries the other idea, king d5 looking to come over here, we got king e2, and let's say the king tries to go to e4, here we got knight c5 check, and you can actually give up the pawn this way, take this pawn, and this is gonna be drawn. You can sack the knight like that, apparently, and because the bishop is on the wrong color, the king's gonna be able to get over here, Black is not going to be able to promote this pawn. It's a useful endgame to know when the king is on a light square and you only have the bishop on the opposite color is the promotion square of your pawn. White can draw right there. All right, so those are just a few variations to look at. Knight f2, not necessary. King d2, get in front of this passed pawn. Keep your knight a little more centrally located. It has some more options. 
This next position again comes from the Sinkfield Cup. Carlson has the white pieces against Wesley So, and he throws away the win with this knight c4 move. Wesley did not fully take advantage of this, and he played a bad move himself. Bishop takes d4, and after this, knight takes a5, forking the queen and rook. Queen moves, you get the exchange back. Bishop c5, Carlson plays queen d5, and he has a winning position. This pawn tries to run, but he's got a5, and he ends up winning this. So bishop takes d4 was not the right response here. Wesley So could have had a drawn position if he would have played queen to c7. Okay, so now what does white have? This pawn's protected here. You can take the pawn on d6, and now you got rook takes c4. Okay, then you can take on b6, you get this big exchange of pieces. Queen takes c4, and now black has this rook e7 move. He has enough activity with this pass pawn to counter what the white queen and rook are gonna try to do. Because, let's say queen c8, you try to give him some trouble, some checks, you're just gonna block them all with your rook, right? And otherwise, he's just gonna start pushing that pawn. Now, if you blockade it with your rook like this, white doesn't have enough activity. It's gonna now take this rook two moves to get in an attacking position against the black king. So black apparently can hold this, according to Stockfish. Now, you can contrast that to the correct move back here. Instead of knight c4, Carlson should've went rook takes d6. Okay, rook takes, rook takes. Now black has some options. The lines I looked at seem to indicate that you need to take out this knight because it's gonna go to d5 and it's gonna cause a lot of problems. But if you take out the knight here, queen takes e3, this is a little different. The queen is blockading the pawn and the difference is this rook is more active and the queen can jump into the attack in one move. And you have the active rook. Apparently this is enough to win because if you go rook e7, there's queen d4, and you're looking to come in here, and this is a winning position. And of course, if you don't take the knight out, like something like bishop c7, we go rook d5, and you there is this variation, where there's pawn, some pawn gobbling on opposite sides of the board, white hits the queen, and then is able to get this pawn on b4, and yeah, at the end of the day, knight d5, and it starts getting really bad for black and his weakened king. So, that was a missed opportunity, even though Carlson did end up winning this game. This next position comes from a game where Kasparov has the white pieces against Topalov from 1999, and he gives Topalov a chance for a draw with this king b2 move. If he would have played bishop d2, he would have been winning. Now the point to this is, this move, bishop d2, gives the rook access to h1, and white's gonna have some threats. Okay, so the queen can check, king goes here. Now it's important to note, black has to be careful. If you do something like bishop takes a4 here, you got this mate with queen h8 check, king goes here, knight e5 is mate. So you have to watch over that diagonal if you're gonna let the queen come into h8 there. So there's this idea of rook takes b4 check, takes, takes, king c1, and you can throw some checks in here, but you don't have enough. And the rook is gonna come over here and black can't get anything going fast enough, apparently. You can throw this check in, king goes here, and white's gonna be fine. Or here you go queen to g6, apparently, and defend that pawn. Now let's contrast that to what was played in the game. King to b2 would have allowed this move. Bishop takes a4. Okay, now this is a little different. One move makes a big difference here. Bishop d2. Now this rook takes b4 check works better because bishop takes, bishop takes here, and you don't have time. If you try this, okay, so you're still guarding e5. There's not going to be a checkmate. Well, you've moved those bishops out of the way too, so the king has more squares now. But if you try rook h1, this is going to run into a checkmate like that, so... I'm sure there's more lines to look at, but the, at the end of the day, Kasparov, he played this king move, and this would have given Topalov a drawing chance. He should have played bishop d2, activating the rook. In this next position, Topalov has the white pieces. Garry Kasparov is playing black, and instead of moving his queen with queen d8 here, which would have given him a draw, according to Stockfish, he decides to trade off all the pieces. Queen takes, rook takes, and he even takes the knight on d4. And he just misjudged this pawn ending, I guess. He plays d5. White moves his king towards the center. And the king's position themselves. As close to the center as they can get. And 
it ends up that black is in Zogzwang. He doesn't have enough free moves with his pawns. Uh, at this point, Gary Kasparov resigned. Let's look at what he could have tried. G5, pawn takes, pawn takes, king h5. You can see that black's going to lose this pawn here. Maybe a little more resilient would be h5 check, but then king f4. You got this move here. White's got this move in reserve. And now you have to, if you take the pawn like this, it's just, you know, white's going to get his pass pawn easily. You can move the king, but then king e5. Then you can't defend this pawn. You'll just have to take, and then white gets his pass pawn. Yeah. Kasparov misjudged the pawn ending. In this next position, we have Bobby Fischer with the black pieces playing against Janosevic with white. And here the position is roughly equal, but Fischer blunders with f4 check. What he needed to play was knight takes c5. Rook takes, now f4 check. So what's the difference? We're going to look at two lines, one with knight takes c5 and one without. So let's look at this. King h3. Now you have to be careful because this pawn's running. So you have to get your rook in position so you can deliver the check and pick up that pawn. King g4 here. Rook h1. Now you got rook c8 check. Very dangerous. It's guarding the promotion square for the white pawn. But king d7 attacking the rook. So let's say the rook goes in front and king e7. If you take on g5, we got f3. We got counterplay. We're going to draw. Now contrast that to playing f4 check first. Fisher's move, king h3. Now if you try the same thing with rook b1, king g4, these are all the identical moves, but now rook c8 check is a little different because there's no king d7. That knight's still there. You're not going to be attacking the rooks. You can go here and then white gets that pawn. Now here, if you try to take the bishop, rook takes and the rook is in position to deliver a check here in this line. If you start trying to run with your pawn, you're going to lose that pawn. And then if you try f3 here without taking the bishop, the bishop's guarding over that square, so it's not really a threat. The counter advance with your pawn. So that's kind of the difference there. You needed to take out the bishop on c5. Okay, in this last position, Hort is playing white and Fisher is playing black. And he misses the best move. He played bishop c5. He still has a good position and did end up winning this game. But stronger would have been bishop to c1 to keep an attack on this f4 pawn here. So let's just say white makes some passing move. Let's say you go king to g3. The threat here is takes, sacking the bishop for a moment. But after e5, the king will be driven back to a point where e4 will attack this bishop which will be pinned because the king had no choice it had to move on that rank with this black rook and so you will win this end game after you capture the bishop it doesn't really make any difference if white plays this g5 move we'll just go f5 there's still the threat of taking here and there's just not a good defense here interesting okay so let's contrast that with bishop c5 what fisher played now his opponent hort had the opportunity to play g5 which he didn't play and here f5 is still very good for black, but you don't have that threat of taking on f4, that very nice tactic. So the king can go here and then, you know, I don't know how black wins this exactly, but if black can in fact actually win, I don't know. So anyway, that's just a selection of the blunders that I discovered in my little experiment. Tell me if you found this interesting and I'll do another video like this using different openings probably the same three players, but maybe I'll add another player in there. I'm, I'm curious to know how Morphe will stand up with these guys. Please subscribe to the channel if you want to get notified of all these future videos I have coming your way.